Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. Um, so I'm really excited to be here. First, just huge thanks to both Docker and Clever. Clever for hosting us and for giving an awesome talk. But just we love the Docker folks, and I think it's a really a great opportunity to spend a night talking about like different ways to deploy. It. Um, so a little bit of introduction about myself. Um, so I'm one of the co-founders of RethinkDB, and RethinkDB is a open source distributed database um, that is really great for building real-time apps. And uh, I want to talk tonight about specifically deploying those real-time apps because there's a lot of really cool technologies around building them. I'm going to talk about what a real-time app is in a moment. Um, but there's a whole cool new stack to help build these apps. But deploying them is actually pretty challenging. Um, and Docker makes this really easy um, in a lot of respects. And uh, RethinkDB is really well suited. It pairs well with Docker. I want to talk about some of those features and what makes it really interesting. So um, the first question is, like, what is a real-time app? Um, you're probably all familiar with like Google Docs. Like this is the kind of experience that people expect. So you have like users using the same app at the same time. They're all typing and talking to each other. And the thing is, like we kind of started using these apps around maybe like five to ten years ago. And now people actually expect these kinds of user experiences. They demand it. So if you are building an app that has this real-time component, it feels um, you know solid. It doesn't react to what's happening in the data. It doesn't interact with other users on the system. And so these are the experiences that people really expect. Another app that we really use at Reefing to be a lot, we love, is Slack. Slack is amazing. So it's this great chat system. People done chat 50 times before, except Slack did it correctly. And so it's been very popular amongst a bunch of, bunch of startups and, and companies. And what's really cool about it is not just that it's chat, it's that you also have like these apps on your phone. And you get notified when someone messages you. You get all these different um, clients that are all talking to each other at the same time across devices. Um, across uh, different channels, across companies, and it all feels very real time. It's lots of things happening, but it's really just a web app. They have this really slick OSX app, and it's really just wrapping this HTML thing that's just you know talking to, to um, the Slack servers and doing a lot of awesome real time communication. The problem is that deploying these things is actually really hard. So. Um, in a typical architecture, and I apologize for architecture diagrams, I know I usually hate them, but they're really instructive when we're talking about deployments. So I'm going to break this down each one that I show to you. Um, you have a bunch of these Slack servers, like these app servers that are working for the web, and then you have a Slack mobile app, and they're all talking to the database. They want to persist all the messages that are happening, but they also have to talk to each other. So they use publish subscribe, they use message queues, systems like Rabbit and Queue or other queuing systems, and they have to notify each other whenever updates happen. And so you end up having, when you have to deploy a lot of these things and scale these architectures, you end up having to basically um, have exponentially more difficult and complicated systems because each time you add another system to talk to each between these um, app servers, uh, it increases the complexity. And so uh, this, is, this is really challenging. So we basically rethink DBM to talk about for a minute. I mentioned that it's really great for building these kinds of apps. And, uh, I want to talk about what that actually means. So we basically built this thing, um, this database that's for the modern web. Um, it works with JSON. It integrates with your favorite programming language. Um, it has a really nice query language that's really flexible. Developers um, can build things. They can chain things out. Uh, it's functional. It's composable. Uh, it also has a lot of tools to help you build, shard, and replicate clusters. So I'm just going to quickly show you what that actually looks like. I'm not going to delve into details, but you get like this when you start using the system. You get this UI. This is a running cluster on EC2. And it's live performance graphs. Um, you're able to basically look at the, the tables and the servers in your system, uh, and you're able to write queries and execute them. And this is like a really slick system if you just want to be able to prototype and develop apps, but it's also great for managing it, um, for sharding, replicating this cluster. And so uh, the question is now, like, what actually makes this really well suited for real time? Um, that sounds like a lot of other databases in some respects. And the trick is that we um, have a feature called change feeds, which is this really awesome feature. And what change feeds are is this idea that you can subscribe to notifications on a table. And suppose you have a table, like we have this example here, where you're tracking the scores in your game. And you're saying r.table scores, then you tell it dot changes, and it sends you a stream of data. It notifies you when there's an update in that table. It tells you when things are added, when they're modified, when they're deleted. And in this case, all we're doing is saying for each of the changes, just print that change. But you can imagine in your apps, you can re-render views, you can do all sorts of things. So instead of long pulling your, um, your database or trying to figure out what's changed, instead you're just subscribing to the table and saying, tell me when things have changed. And then your app will react and um, listen to those changes. In the example of Slack, Slack would just say, what are the new messages in this table? And instead of getting notified every five milliseconds, it would get notified maybe once an hour or once every 24 hours. And so, um, and this gets even more exciting, and we have this upcoming version where it's not just tables that you're able to subscribe to. You'll be able to subscribe to any query. So you could ask a query like as sophisticated as, give me all the um, people who live 
within two miles of the zip code and are aged between 22 and 30 and tweeted between the hours of 2 a.m. and 7 a.m. every second Thursday of the month, and then tell me the average number of tweets that they've tweeted, and then only tell me when the average changes. Because this lets you basically do aggregations. So you're notified when something has changed as the computation of the things within your table from your database. This is really exciting because basically when you write an app, instead of just listening to this table, you also can say, here's the actual queries I care about, and only tell me when that query result changes. So you're writing these really cool architectures where you're building these reactive apps that are built for these real-time infrastructures. And like this is what it looks like. This is what actually gets you. We talked about deployment. This is what you actually get when you start using these change feeds. So each of these servers, you have your Slack servers again. They're subscribing to a change feed. A change feed is as cheap as a connection to the database, so it's not like some added complexity. But you, they just talk to the ReadingDB cluster, and instead of talking to each other, they just tell the database what they have as new data. And then every, every node in the cluster says, oh, tell me about the new data, and only when it changes. And you can scale this really easily because you can just add these servers, and it's as cheap as just adding connections to the database. There are no queuing systems or complexities to be, have nodes talk to each other, or workers talk to each other. Um, so I want to talk about deploying an, an app. Uh, so we had Ryan Paul um, is a guy who used to write for Ars Technica, and he really loves like, um, novel web technology. So when he heard that we were building like this you know, database, he was like, I really want to help you um, uh, talk about like some of these features. He was really excited by some of the stuff like change feeds. So naturally the first thing he built had to do with cats because it's the internet and everyone loves cats and that's all we really care about. So he basically uh, built this app it's called Cats of Instagram and it subscribes to this really popular hashtag that everyone uh, uh, posts with hashtag Cats of Instagram. And what it does is this app uses the geo data with each post to basically uh, to basically notify, uh, to, to be able to build a map, a real-time map, of cats as they are um, being posted around the world. And this app is built with like Socket.io and ReadingDB change feeds, so it's, it's a reasonable real-time app infrastructure. Um, so basically, I'm just going to show you the app because it's, it's, it's cute and fun. Um, there we go. So this is the app, and it's running live on EC2. Um, we're a little slow with the network today, but basically, you have these people posting, and as they're going to be filling in posts, the, um, this, this worker is going to receive a, a real-time feed from Instagram. And it's going to just post the new cats as they come in. And we can watch it for a few minutes in the background. We've actually rate limited it because we don't want to hit the API limits. Um, but I mentioned this reading to be cluster here. If we go to the dashboard, and we're looking at what's happening in the system. Um, there we go. OK, so there's a new cats coming in now. And <laughs> there we go. Uh, we're having some network issues, which is just a little bit slow. But basically, you're able to look at the performance graph and rights are happening to the database. And new cats are coming in. And you can look on the map and you can figure out exactly where those cats are. <laughs> and this is awesome because basically, you can just throw up a bunch of these, um, these workers and they don't have to talk to each other and say, hey, I got a new cat. I found out about a new cat on Instagram. They're just listening to the database and getting notified um, when, when these new cats are appearing. There we go. We have one in Af that's a South American cat. So, <laughs> um, and it is actually not all just cats because, because it's a pop up tag on Instagram, people actually abuse it and they just post their photo with this really popular tag. So, you may see not just cats here, but all of these are lots of cats. So, um, so that's the app. And the thing is, like, if I were to try to deploy this you know, in a normal system, it might be a little bit frustrating because of these queues and figure out how to get these things to talk to each other. But Docker actually makes this really easy when paired with Reading TV. Because change feeds allow you to build these stateless apps that don't have to share the state of the system, don't have to talk to each other, don't have to have any data that they know about that they have to subscribe or publish to each other. Instead, you can basically just um, store these stateless apps inside of a Docker container, build it locally, and then ship it up to some service, and then run them all in parallel and scale it as much as you want. So it makes it really trivial to scale these real-time apps. I'm going to show you exactly what I mean. So I've chosen to use a pattern of AWS. It doesn't really matter which system you use, but AWS gets you a lot of cool properties when paired with um, complex infrastructures for pretty cheaply um, in terms of complexity. And uh, one thing is that um, if you want an EC2, Reaching TV has an AMI that's pre-built. Um, so you can just, with a click in the web store, you can just start up a, a, a couple instances. I'm going to show you what the console looks like in a second to see if you can see how my instance is running. You also get these security groups. You have these VPCs that are very restricted parts of the data center. So um, Amazon spent a lot of time and engineering effort into basically um, making sure that you don't have to deal with firewalls or IP tables or things like that to restrict the communication between nodes in a shared data center. Um, and so VPCs basically help you lock down that set of the cluster. Um, you also uh, can add applications and other Amazon services to these VPCs using security groups. 
Um, and the last component of this is basically Elastic Beanstalk. I don't know if you guys have heard of it or used it before, but basically Elastic Beanstalk, um, they announced support for Docker a little while back. You can throw up a Docker container, you have to package it with some metadata, and then it can, it'll automatically build and deploy it, and you can add workers. Um, as load increases, it'll add more Docker containers, and as load decreases, it'll scale it down. So I'll show you exactly what my infrastructure looks like, just pretty quickly. Um, so if we look at my management console, there's some bump up on sites here. So I have a couple of uh, rethink to be nodes that are running. Um, so you can see like this, uh, let me go to instances here. So I have these instances, I'm gonna wait for it to load. So these are all my, my uh, nodes in my cluster. I've named my servers, because I always like naming schemes after um, the moons of Jupiter. Uh, so, but um, you can see they're all running in um, M3 mediums, which is a reasonably, we usually recommend running with about two gigs of RAM. And they're all clustered together. So we go back to the, um, to the RethinkDB cluster. I think we're having some connectivity issues because of the network. But um, if you go to the UI, it, you can see actually in the background it says four to four servers reachable. Um, and basically this means that they're all talking to each other and they're, they're, um, it's, it's all clustered. Now you notice I have this other instance, Instacat. Instacat is the name of our app, right? So it's running on a T1 micro, or the smallest instance possible. Um, that's because it's a really cheap, small container. So I'm just switched to Elastic Beanstalk. Elastic Beanstalk is really nice because it basically, you're able to upload new versions to the system, it tells you logs about what's happening, and you can see it's running basically a, a minimal version of Linux from Amazon, um, and a, uh, sorry, that's just some problems around here. Uh, but it's running a minimal version of uh, a version of Docker and a minimal, minimal version of Linux. So when you upload this, it's just going to build your container based on the Docker file and then deploy it. So right now I'm just going to show you, I can go to the configuration, and you'll see that in the scaling it says number of instances one to four. This means that it'll start with one instance, and as load increases, it'll ramp up to four, and then it'll go back down. So if I just hit this button and say, now I want three nodes, we're going to have three Instacat servers running. Um, they're not going to talk to each other, they don't need to, because of change feeds, but when I hit this button, it's going to do the configuration change, validate it. Um, you'll also notice there's a lot of other cool features, like you can tell which availability zones to run in, things like that if you want to make your app really redundant. Um, and now this has been committed, so I go to the dashboard, and you'll see that it says basically, um, there we go, environment update is starting. Now it does take a little while, maybe like anywhere from five minutes to 15 minutes, particularly because I'm running on micros, so it's building like dark containers. Um, it might take a little while to deploy. Um, so I'm just going to uh, talk about, while it's updating, I'm going to talk about some other interesting uh, details. So um, here's what you need to know about Elastic Beanstalk. To be able to deploy your app, you have a Docker file. This is a simple Node.js app, nothing complicated. All I'm doing is pulling the latest Ubuntu image. I'm installing Node.js. I'm adding my, um, my data files from source, as you can see, and uh, installing npm dependencies, telling what port it should expose, and then um, telling it what, how to run the app. And then basically the manifest is very simple. You can do a lot of things you can tell it like, find the logs within my container and expose it out, or like mount to volume on S3 or things like that. But in this case, it's very simple. I'm just telling it, um, whenever you need to contact the worker, contact it at port 8091, and then do the translation to, to be able to have uh, all the, when you hit domain name, to be able to resolve it to the right worker at the right port. So it's mapping port 80 to port 8091. And all these things are based, all these nodes are sitting behind a load balancer, which is part of what you get as results of uh, Amazon Web Services and Beanstalk. So you basically, you have one domain name, they're all hitting the load balancer, and it's getting routed to each worker that I want to talk to. So um, we're just gonna quickly launch an app here, um, a new one. This is my cats of, uh, of Instagram here. And basically, all I need to do is, um, I have this Docker file, my manifest, and then all my app files are inside of this. So all I have to do is pull it up together, and then just zip them up. We're gonna call this More Cats. And then I'm gonna go to uh, Elastic Beanstalk. I have my, my running app, it's updating right now. But I'm going to hit uh, Create Application down here. I'm just gonna zoom out a little bit. We're gonna call it More Cats. It'll be available at the domain name, morecats.com. ElasticBeanstalk.com. Um, it's going to start creating the application. This might take a moment. Okay, so we'll, we'll uh, flip to the presentation. Oh, there we go, actually. Okay, so the launch new environment, we're going to pick, I think we're having network problems, which is why it's a bit slow. Um, but we're going to pick the tier of the environment. It's going to be a web server. Um, and the platform is going to be Docker. And then it's going to be a single instance environment. 
um, by default, but actually what it's going to do instead is it's going to offer you the option to do load balanced um, and uh, or auto scaling. Uh, load balancing, auto scaling. We hit next. So I'm going to upload this file. All I have to do is go find that zip file, more cats, and hit next. So it's uploading the file right now, it'll take a little while. And it's gonna ask me a bunch of questions next, which is basically, um, what, where, do I, where do I stick it? What security group do I add it to? Um, and how do I find exactly all the, the um, VPC that's supposed to belong to? All you have to do is choose those details, and then hit launch, and it'll start to build the Docker instance, and then deploy it across the Elastic Beanstalk. So while it's doing that, I'm just gonna revisit um, here. This is basically, as I said, inside that file, these are the only two things you need to be able to spin the thing up. So I talked about a lot of nouns and a lot of things that are connected to things, and that's always complicated. So I'm just going to give you a quick refresh. We have a real-time feed of cats, and it's hitting the load balancer. The load balancer is just telling it, give me a Docker container. Those cats go to one of those containers. Then the container says, I got a new cat. Send it to Rethink TV, because we want all the other people to know about it. Um, it sends it to the cluster, and then all the other nodes receive a message, we have a new cat. And they'll receive it, and you're able to see the new cat appear in your feed. And all these things are running within this virtual private cloud as part of the same security. So this awesome secure cluster with all these tools working together. And the next thing is that that's all it takes. You have these stateless apps that are just talking to the database. So um, there's a couple flaws um, that, are, that are worth um, talking about. The biggest thing is that Elastic Load Balancer by default does always gotchas like this. Um, Elastic Load Balancer does not support WebSockets by default. So we're using Socket.io, which you guys may be familiar with. It's a really cool tool for basically doing this, you know, for using WebSockets. Um, but uh, ELB basically uh, makes you fall back to JSONP or to long clone with Ajax. But the thing is, you can actually configure Elastic Load Balancer to work with WebSockets. It just requires using a mode called, um, for, it requires you to use TCP and SSL. Um, so there's some configuration I didn't do for this talk, but it is definitely possible to be able to use WebSockets as well through the load balancer. Um, but fundamentally, this means that you can basically build these really cool scalable um, reactive infrastructures that don't require queuing systems and don't require lots of complicated infrastructure. And so that's kind of the philosophy we have at RethinkDB. This is a, it's a very horizontal product. I touched on one feature in particular. But the philosophy we have is that these, you know, like Arthur C. Clarke said, like any sufficiently advanced technology should be indistinguishable from magic. And uh, that's kind of what we took from that, like, let's make database tools feel indistinguishable with magic. And the whole point is that every time you have something that's hard and complicated, let's figure out how to like, help you build it in a different way. Um, so I urge you to go check out WeThinkDB.com if you want to play with the product, um, and we'll be around to talk afterwards. There's also, if you start playing with the product, um, uh, if you have time tomorrow, um, my co-founder Slava will be at Workshop Cafe um, doing office hours. So if you want to play with a new app, or you have a question about what I talked about today, or you have anything you just try to spin up a node and run into some problems, or just have a question about how to build these architectures, he can, uh, he can definitely sit down with you and spend some time talking about it. Um, so that's pretty much my talk. I, I uh, wonder if everyone has questions or comments. I'd be happy to hear them.